Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. So when you uh, are moving out to emergence from anesthesia, I mean, so you have to consider the uh, time for extubation, the best way to do it. Our group also uh, tried to make some recommendations to this very sensitive period of anesthesia. This is the case that I brought to you. So a uh, woman, she is 168 centimeters high, 77 kilogram. She has ovarian cancer. The medical history is not that much interesting. So she smoked, she has major depression, she's on SSRIs. During the preoperative examination, so um, there were breasts and heart sounds that were normal. So the preoperative SpO2 or room air was 97%. Regarding intubation, so there was the malampati score of three and other values or let's say labs, hypoalbuminemia, mild anemia, and she is uh, scheduled for general anesthesia and with an epidural catheter. So uh, she was operated in an open approach. So this was lasting up to five hours in supine position. So during the intraoperative phase, she had a loss of two liters uh, due to ascites. She had many desaturation episodes, and um, the anesthetist, anesthesiologist performed a lung recruitment maneuver twice and decided to increase the PEEP to nine centimeters of water, uh, was able to cap the saturation within limits uh, with a FiO2 of 0.6. So this is my first question to you. Regarding the emergency from anesthesia, the body position should be Maintain until extubation is completed. Do you agree? Do you do not agree? Or you don't know? Please vote now. So remember the patient was in supine position. And how should we proceed? Okay, thanks so much. So the most of you uh, does not agree that the patient should be kept in this position. This is very interesting. So we have to have in mind, so the possible positions that we consider now for such a patient. So, and this is one, uh, let's say, very small study that was uh, performed in patients in supine position, as you can see here on the right side. So you had uh, the measurement of FRC, uh, in the control situation, which was the supine, the patient was flat lying on the bed. Uh, then you have the second position, which was the beach chair, more or less. So not exactly the beach chair, but uh, you have an elevation of the upper part of the body. And uh, so in this trial, there was no really benefit in terms of uh, the increase of the FRC. Uh, only in this patient here, or let's see, in this study here, the um, reverse standard and broken position so that you have the patient flat, so there's no beach chair, so you have an inclination of the angle. So also the, the lower limbs, they are, let's say, in a down position, so there was an increase of the FRC. I come to the next question to you, now regarding the uh, suctioning of the tracheal tube. Please remember the patient uh, was, is a smoker, and you should consider, so if you have to suction the uh, endotracheal tube prior to extubation. Do you agree with this? You do not agree or you don't know? So the patient had some episodes of desaturation, possibly there were some secretions in the tube. So what is your approach here? How do you deal with this? Okay, so most of you do not agree to, uh, to make the suctioning, but it's still we have almost 40% that agree you should previously, let's say, suctioning the tube, uh, the endotracheal tube. So what happens when you do this? If you take a look, um, so if you consider a single lumen tube, which is the case here uh, in this patient that we are talking about, and you have, let's say, a suctioning with a disconnection, you can see here in terms of the loss 
of the lung volume. So if it's a complete disconnection, you do have a decrease and you have over time an increase again if you come back to uh, tidal ventilation, which is not the case. So if you have a closed suctioning, maybe you have less of such an effect. So you, see, you can see here, the loss of the lung volume is a little bit lower and so you need uh, less time to recover and to restore the lung volumes. So the double lumen tube is not so the issue here. Well, what are the recommendations that we have from uh, this group of experts? So first, regarding the positioning of the patient, so you should first of all so avoid zip in this patient during emergency. So, and you should also avoid uh, the suctioning of the endotracheal tube immediately prior to the tracheal extubation. So you should avoid also apnea with zip, with zero and expiratory pressure prior to the extubation. And we had a consensus for this recommendation here with a very low uh, quality of evidence and the, uh, the recommendation was still weak. So the next question that I have to you is uh, regarding the use of FiO2. So remember the patient was being ventilated with 0.6. Uh, so this was necessary to keep the saturation. So what you would like to do with this patient? Do you agree that we should uh, reduce the FiO2 uh, maybe below even 0.4? to limit the formation of, the, of atelectasis in, let's say, to improve uh, the amount of air that we have for, mechanical, for, uh, for ventilation of those patients. So do you agree to reduce? Do you do not agree to reduce for extubation? You don't know. Please vote now. Okay, so it's very, let's say it's more or less 50-50 here, what we have, some of you agree, um, up to 40% agree, and uh, maybe I don't know, the 7% does not uh, know what to do. Well, so the issue here is, of course, if you have more nitrogen in the lungs, then you limit the formation of the electrolysis. So this can be interesting for the postoperative period, but on the other hand, so you are going uh, with a patient that has been uh, mechanically ventilated for uh, five hours. The patient had a malampart score of three. And sometimes the conditions that you have in the airways, they can change. So this is a matter of safety here that we have. And uh, possibly the best option would not be to extubate that patient with a low FiO2, even if you have, let's say, the risk of formation of atelectasis. So the next question is also related to this, uh, to this case here, to this situation. So if you had decided to use FiO2 higher than 0.8 during the extubation period, so do you think that CPAP should be used? Do you agree with this approach? You don't agree or you don't know? Please vote now. So remember the patient had a malampite score of three and is now being extubated FiO2 higher. Okay, so the most of you agree in this case to, to put the patient on CPAP. Well, this is the issue that we have to deal with. Um, atelectasis depends very much on the end expiratory fraction of oxygen. And this is, uh, let's say, shown here in this picture so beyond values of 40, 50 percent, you have the increase of the formation of atelectasis. So if you are higher than 8 percent, you go to, let's say, values close to 100 percent. So you have quasi a maximization of the formation of atelectasis. But on the other hand, we have the issue that apnea tolerance depends also on the entire fraction of oxygen. So the less oxygen that you have, so the less time you have on apnea. So if you have any uh, situation that you have to reintubate this patient on a condition such, such a, a malampart uh, free score condition can 
uh, over, even if it was, let's say, not a, a, an issue during induction. Things change during the intraoperative period. You give liquids, so sometimes you have the uh, decrease of uh, the diameter of the airways, so you should to take care and think on this. This is the reason why we have this recommendation here. So, in the appropriate clinical scenario, so the use of low FiO2 during emergency from general anesthesia can improve in pulmonary function in the perioperative period. You can see here the consensus was only 71%, so I was one that voted against. And you can see the quality of evidence is very low and the strength of the recommendation is weak. So please be careful with such, let's say, reductions of FiO2 in this type of patients. On the other hand, if you are using an FiO2 that is higher than 0.8% that you saw, so it was associated with, let's say, more um, uh, formation of atelectasis. In those patients during emergence of, uh, of anesthesia, then you can consider to use CPAP immediately following the tracheal extubation. This could reduce the risk of resorption atelectasis. But you can see here the consensus, at least in the group, was much, much lower than the consensus that we had here in this audience today. Anyway, this is uh, a weak recommendation. The next question that I have to you is, regarding this patient here, so when you go, the patient is now extubated, you are going maybe to the PACU with this patient here. So uh, the use of supplemental oxygen should be given, should be done prophylactically, so in this patient to avoid desaturation. Remember that we had episodes of desaturation during uh, the intraoperative period. So do you agree to give oxygen prophylactically? You don't agree or you don't know? Please vote now. I can tell you that most of those patients, they they are still receiving some supplemental oxygen, even if the saturation does not occur. So, most of you agree, but it's still, so it's a considerable uh, percentage of people here that does not agree. Let's see. So, what do we have uh, in the literature regarding supplemental oxygen? So, what do we know that is that in patients, for example, with heart failure, the use of supplemental oxygen is able to impair the cardiac output, stroke volume, to increase the PCVP, and uh, also to increase the systemic vascular resistance in those patients. So in volunteers, so we were able, so those investigators were able to see a decrease in the heart index and also an increase in the systemic vascular resistance. And so in a wide range of patients, so the um, complications, respiratory complications within 30 days, so they were increased, and also the mortality in those patients that were receiving uh, supplemental oxygen. This is not an interventional trial, it was an observational study, but it's still, so it makes me uh, a little bit scared to give uh, oxygen, supplemental so oxygen to those patients without a decrease in the saturation. And this is the recommendation that we have here, according to our panel, administration of postoperative supplemental oxygen is recommended when uh, room air, uh, say, uh, SpO2, the saturation, let's say, uh, in room air is below 94. So you have a clear indication. Otherwise, it should not be given. So whatever the goal that you set, so uh, then you have to say, okay, in those patients, selected patients, yes, supplement oxygen, otherwise not. So the consensus in the group was 100%, so the quality of evidence is still uh, not that high, and this is, uh, uh, from the strengthness, it's a weak recommendation. So, and this is my uh, last question to you. So, regarding the post extubation period in this patient here, so if this patient had used for any reason uh, already non-invasive ventilation, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or CPAP, should this be continued postoperatively? Do you agree to continue this? 
Do you do not agree to continue or you don't know? Please vote now. Thank you. So you agree to give this and this is really uh, a huge number, almost 90% of you agree to continue in this case and this is um, exactly so what we um, uh, got in this panel here. So if those patients that have been on CPAP, have been on, let's say, uh, non-invasive ventilation, this should be continued uh, in the post-operative period. This was a consensus of 100% in our group. So the quality of evidence is not that high, but it still is a strong recommendation. So just remember here that what we have maybe is a little bit a difference between, let's say, um, a prophylactic or a, a therapeutic approach. In this case here, it's prophylactic that we are dealing. Thank you so much for your attention.